Hello, this is Ray Bowman, and in this lesson uh, we're going to talk about how to perform an industry analysis. And um, the focus of my courses are international business, and certainly um, this is a technique that can be used for international businesses, but this is also a technique that can be used for any domestic business. Uh, what I find a lot is in the companies I deal with, a lot of the companies are fairly good at doing a market analysis, you know, segmenting their market, looking at their competition, but quite often companies forget to do an industry analysis. And it's very important to look at both a market analysis, looking at your, um, the, the people, the buyers that you want to sell to, but it's equally important to analyze the dynamics of the industry that you have to compete in. One of the best tools I've found for doing an industry analysis is what's called the five force analysis. Uh, Michael Porter uh, was the developer of the five force analysis and I find it a really good um, way of being able to focus on the different things that really impact an industry. And if you're not familiar with the five force analysis, a five force analysis deals with uh, five different forces that can be threats or conversely enhance income opportunities. And so originally when the five forces came out, it was really the focus was on uh, what are the threats to the market? You know, what, what are the threats to your income or your earning potential in a particular market? But I like to look at the five force analysis as really being both risk and opportunity looking at these questions from a standpoint of risk, but also looking at them from a standpoint of opportunity. So I think it's good to look at the five force analysis in both ways. A five force analysis deals with these five factors. And the first factor is called rivalry, fa uh, rivalry factors. So these are really factors that involve rivalry among existing competition. Then we go to threats to entry uh, and exit within a market. The next part of the five force analysis is looking at substitutes and complements within a market and looking at um, the power that suppliers have within an industry and likewise looking at the power that buyers have within an industry. So we're going to cover each one of these five forces now from the beginning. And what I've done with uh, the five force analysis that I use is I put questions onto those five forces because I find a lot of times when you're sitting down with companies um, or I'm sitting down with my own firm and I'm trying to do an industry analysis, just looking at these basic uh, five components isn't enough. You usually need some questions to sort of um, help with the writer's block in what areas are you actually going to analyze within those five forces. So I'm going to go through each one of these. Um, this is meant to be a checklist, so quite often what I'll do with clients is I'll go over a five force analysis and have them to the best of their ability do homework um, and research to try to see what they come up with as far as answers to each of these five areas. So in terms of rivalry factors, one important uh, factor to look at is the rate of industry growth within the target country. So uh, especially doing international business, it's very important to look at those industry trends. Uh, now in previous lessons I've talked about doing a top 25 market analysis uh, which is fairly straightforward and easy to do in the US uh, for both imported and exported goods. And when you do that type of analysis, it's good to look at a three-year trend to see if that market is declining or it's rising. So it's very important to look uh, at what those industry trends are amongst competitors. Can the firms in the target market adjust quickly? In some industries, um, adjustments can happen very quickly. Right? Competitors have new innovations and everyone can get on board. There are other industries that can't adjust quite as quickly. Uh, maybe because of factors in technology, uh, you know, the, the industry may be locked into certain types of protocols or technology, or it may just be the nature of that industry in terms of its infrastructure and its inability to adjust to changes quickly. But these are things that are important to look at. 
Uh, brand loyalty. What is the brand loyalty in the target market? Um, some types of products really don't command a lot of loyalty. Uh, in other industries, brand loyalty is very strong, so you have to look at that as well. What are the switching costs for buyers? Switching costs for buyers heavily influences your sales cycle. Um, for example, I spent uh, over 20 years in the logistics industry. And in the logistics industry, switching costs were fairly substantial. Uh, if a company was going to uh, use my services over someone else's, uh, the conversion of that business took a certain amount of time. So again, that's a factor that has to be looked at. Do your competitors cooperate on price within your industry? Um, this is an important thing. How sensitive are customers to uh, in the target market to price increases? And it's good to look at the sensitivity of price in the different parts of the value chain. The customers at the retail end may not be very sensitive, but as you go through more to the business to business side of it, the sensitivity gets uh, a lot greater because of the size of the purchases. Is there much uh, product differences among sellers? In some industries there's very little differentiation. Uh, in some industries though it can be quite substantial. Now let's take a look at threats to entry or exit within a market. So some questions that are important to ask are, can you easily access distribution channels? Or are these distribution channels closed to new entrants in the market? So uh, particularly now in international business, it's important to know um, what, what it takes to enter a market in different types of countries and trade lanes. It can be substantially different depending upon the country that you're dealing with. Can you access the right technologies for the market? Um, whether it's consumer electronics, computer software, you have to be aware of the types of technologies required. Or maybe there's certain infrastructure required in order to make your product successful uh, within that market. Can you access locations throughout your target countries? Um, this can be a real critical consideration uh, in various countries where um, where it's very regionalized and the ability to get into all the markets throughout a particular country might be uh, very difficult. Do the incumbents in a market have experience-based advantages? Most of the time they will have those advantages, right, because they've been in that market. But it's important to know what those advantages are and how long-lasting those benefits are. Does the local government protect local industries? very critical thing to look at. I've had many clients um, try to penetrate a market with no success because the government was protecting those markets and they didn't realize those protections were there. Will incumbents react to new entrants in the market? If so, how? Um, the U.S. is a great example of this. The U.S. consumer market is so huge. We're the largest consumer on earth. So quite often a new entrance uh, the, other, um, the other incumbents in the market may or may not react to it. Uh, let's say that there's a new brand of car coming out on the market. There may or may not be uh, any direct uh, retaliation by the market. Whereas in some industries, particularly those where there's, there's only a few players, uh, the consequences may, might be a lot greater. Now we go on to factors of substitute and complements. And remember, when you go through these, um, through these different forces, it's important to look at both opportunity as well as risk. And uh, in, in this category, it's very important. So substitute. What are the available close substitutes to a product? Um, sometimes those substitutes aren't your direct product, but some other product. Uh, in, in a food market, it may be buying you know, chicken over beef. It may be uh, opting for one technology over another. It might be opting for a very simple technology over a very high-tech costly one. But it's very important to know what those substitutes. For every product, there's a substitute in the market. What is the value-added attributes of those substitutes? Are, are, are the value adds cost? because it's cheaper even though it's more low-tech? Or are those value-adds have to do with certain features or benefits? 
what are some of the complements within the industry? This is critical because, especially in overseas markets, you may find um, that the best distributor may be tied up with one of the large incumbents. In that case, you might have to look for a complementary product to yours to find that perfect distributor. What are the value-added traits of those complements? And again, uh, looking carefully at the opportunity of complements, a lot of those complementary products can turn out to be alliances that will help you penetrate uh, an overseas market. Which firms are domestic and which ones are foreign? In other words, looking at your competitors uh, and those competitive products um, with any given country, are you competing against a foreign competitor or are you competing mostly against domestic competitors? So wh what are the country of origin of those products? Next is looking at the power of suppliers. Are there few suppliers that service your industry? In other words, do you make a product that has very few suppliers and you're reliant on those suppliers? Or do you have a product where the suppliers for your product are many and uh, it sort of keeps pricing and competition in check? What are the typical gross sales volumes of your supplier as opposed to the clients they service? Um, you might find that your suppliers are much smaller than you are, or you may find the opposite, that they're much larger. Um, if your suppliers are larger, there may be a threat um, for the, from them to vertically integrate into your market, so that's an important consideration. Um, are there many substitutes to your current suppliers? In other words, do you have options? Do you have a plan B? Um, what are the threats as to those suppliers integrating forward? So as I mentioned again, you always have to be careful of uh, either your buyers or suppliers vertically integrating into your market and competing against you. And I've had many uh, situations where I've dealt with clients that had that exact problem. Do suppliers price discriminate against between the companies they sell to? Now there's always going to be some price discrimination based on size of orders, size of the buyer, um, but in some markets there can be price discrimination solely based on the type of relationship that's formed. Do your industry purchases make up a majority of business to your suppliers? This can be a good or bad thing. This can mean that you have leverage over your suppliers, but it also could mean that um, there are other pressures from maybe larger buyers than you influencing the market. Next are factors related to power of buyers. Are the buyers in your industry more concentrated than the sellers? This can be a problem because that means, uh, let's say that your buyers are very large, you might uh, be competing against that same small amount of business or same few customers that everyone's fighting over. I know when I was in the freight industry, it was very much like that. Most of the logistics companies were chasing after the top 20% of uh, potential logistics users or buyers. Are the buyers in the industry large volume purchasers? In other words, do those buyers have leverage over you or do you have leverage over them because of the size? Do the buyers in the market establish close relationships with certain competitors? Uh, likewise, uh, if, if that isn't the case, can you establish closer relationships? So you, again, you have to look at these uh, both from the standpoint of opportunity and risk. What is the price sensitivity of your buyers and what are the factors that influence that sensitivity? It's very important when you're selling uh, to buyers anywhere, whether it's domestic or internationally, that you understand what their price sensitivity is in terms of any price increases uh, that you may levy against that customer. What portion of your industry constitutes your buyer's product? So it's very important to know how much leverage that you have over your client in terms of that size. So again, these five forces are critical considerations when you're doing an industry analysis. And a market analysis alone isn't enough. Uh, so many companies that I've dealt with have had problems because they didn't anticipate competition 
or conditions within an industry within a certain market. I've also had a lot of uh, clients that I've worked with who assume that the industry conditions in other countries are the same as their home market. And that's seldom true. You always have to look at each trade lane individually and do your competitive analysis and your industry analysis specific to each trade lane that you're exporting to. So I hope this video was helpful and uh, we will see you again soon. Thank you.